Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to the Shore and Steen Center um, event. It's part of the Digital Advisory Board at Kennedy School. Um, I'm Yasmin Fodil, one of the co-chairs of the Dub 2 o PIC. Um, and I'm very happy to introduce Andrew Hoffman, who's going to be speaking tonight. Um, Andrew, I'm just going to give you a short bio. Andrew was appointed as the first ever Chief Information Officer for the New York State Senate in February 2009, <coughs> with a mission to dramatically improve the Senate's transparency, citizen participation, and operational efficiency through technology. Um, to that end, the CIO's office works in three main realms. On the transparency side, this includes opening up the Senate's legislative and administrative data for public access. On the efficiency side, this means overhauling the Senate's internal communications and collaboration infrastructure. And on the public participation side, this means launching new Web 2.0 and social media technologies. Previously, Andrew co-founded the NASA CoLab program at the Ames Research Center, which increased efficiency and transparency at NASA by building new partnerships between the agency and external communities of practice, um, such as the entrepreneurial technology community, the global open source software movement, and constituents of Second Life. Andrew has also founded several startup technology companies and has served as a strategy consultant, advisor, or board member for the leading, for leading technology and political organizations, um, such as the Craigslist Foundation, Netroots Nation, the Space Generation Advisory Council, and the New Organizing Institute. Um, and for you know those of you who regularly come to these events, um, this is a special treat. There's a lot of great work happening at the New York State Senate, um, and I'm especially interested to hear um, directly from Andrew about that great work. Great, thank you. Um, thanks for coming out on such a beautiful day. We are, are clearly as good places to be this afternoon as, as here, so I'm honored that you showed up. Um, since we have a small group, you want to just go around very quickly and just let me know just really briefly who you are, and in particular maybe um, uh, if there's something you'd like to get out of today that you already have an idea about, to mention that, and also just if you give me a sense of whether you consider yourself to be a, an uber geek or a complete technophobe or somewhere in the middle, that would be helpful for me too, because then I can just sort of calibrate the, the jargon or lack thereof that I, that I use. Um, so I'm, I'm Yasmin, um, and I um, am especially interested in hearing about how you know, all of these gov technology changes um, that occur in the technical realm, how that changes the work processes of people and how you can organize people within the organization um, to support those changes. Um, I don't know. I'm closer to the geek scale. I can speak the language, but I don't actually know how to do it. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Andel Koster. Um, and I was most recently working at Personal Democracy Forum uh, and helped them launch the PDF network, and I still work with them a little bit. And, uh, and I would call myself, I think, a tech evangelist. Um, not really geeky, but a fan of all that stuff. Um, I'm Sean. I'm from Colorado Graduate Advocate Research Division. I'm studying social media in organizations and I'm helping do some training for the CIOs in Chinese government. Mm -hmm. But I want to, I'm interested in a personal experience as a CIO. Great. I'm Liz Terry. Um, I'm interested, I guess, in hearing, hearing about how all these technologies that we use socially are actually being applied by the government um, in, in action and not in theory. Um, and I would say I'm definitely on the geekier side, not as up to date on everything current and new, but I love technology. We're, we're here to try to find out what our yeah. brother and brother-in-law actually does for a living. <laughs> 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 I've done all my work out of San Francisco and New York in the last decade, and uh, I, uh, they, my family often tells me they, they follow my Twitter uh, feed, right, and, and that they have absolutely zero clue what I do, so this is uh, an educational afternoon for them. They live in Boston, I grew up in Boston. So. Welcome. Yeah. Um, so I'm <coughs> I, my background is in consulting, um, but I'm also very interested in political campaigns and uh, online organizing, and one of the things I might be doing this summer is uh, working, so I'm originally from Delhi in India, 
and I might be working with the Delhi government to help them do some of this stuff. Uh, so my name is Sandeep Shaw. I also have a background in consulting um, from the UK. Um, I, I think we've talked a lot in the UK about how we can use all sort of government Gov 2.0 and Gov 2.0 and all these new technologies to really to engage people in policy making and law making more. And I suppose I've seen more talk than action. So um, kind of can you hear what's going on here? Hi, my name is Andriana. I, uh, I'm not a uh, technology geek. I work in the Ministry of Finance, uh, and one of the reasons for me coming to the uh, Harvard was uh, figuring out how the way how to open Croatian government more to the public. Uh, high officials, uh, my boss, my minister, he is he doesn't like even to answer questions of journalists, so it's, it's a challenge. So to, to talk about Gov 2.0 so is much nicer than the Yeah. So I, I came to learn about that, and hopefully I'll be able to implement it back home in Croatia and the ministry. Hi, my name is Sam Alghori from uh, Libya. I work with the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Libya. And I'm just interested in uh, anything technological. I might be moving somewhere else in the government. Hi, I'm Felipe. I'm from Mexico. And uh, I'm studying one fellow. And uh, I used to work for the World Bank. And one of the usual says in every meeting is you should invest in better technology. Mm -hmm. But the chances are we never knew how to better technology. So, uh, I'm Bozeraj, I'm from Nepal, uh, I have not have any idea about technology, however I was working in the public sector in the past, in the governance reform and in the future also, I would be expecting in that area, so how uh, you know, I can pressurize my country to be more transparent, open and through this, so very kind more on the management side. And I'm Katie. I came in from here. I was going to be a recovering tech geek while here. I spent a couple of years actually doing information management for the government of the U.S. and um, thought I was going to come do politics and instead keep finding myself stuck back in because there's such a need even in the areas where I'm interested for, for some fly tools. And I'd love to hear some more hopeful stories than some of your kind of nightmares of kids on. So. Great. Well, it's particularly exciting to have uh, people from a number of countries here because I think one of, one of the things I'm excited about, about the potential of everything I'm going to talk about today is the opportunity to blur lines between different um, governments, literally, and whether that be local to state to federal in this country, or whether it be, uh, you know, nation state to nation state, or some future different paradigm. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, of interest not just to um, us in New York State, but I'd like to thank to, to people in every state, but really people all over the world. And I'd love, and as we have a chance to discuss after I talk a little bit, uh, to get your uh, knowledge about what you know is happening in your home uh, countries, because that's I, I would love to be not in the position of innovating at some point in the future, but and <laughs> of being a follower. It's a lot easier. So, and my guess is some of the real groundbreaking uh, work is going to be done ultimately out, outside this country. Um, so. Anyway, I'm excited about that. Uh, so, um, 2009, as many of you may have been aware, has been a, a real banner year for open government. Right away when Obama was inaugurated in January, he um, put his stake in the ground and said that uh, you know, this is going to be a, a more transparent, more open government. Um, and uh, several months ago, he codified that in the form of the Open Government Directive, which directed federal agencies to uh, put together an open government plan um, and to put it online and to um, actually put the put the, uh, the the specifics into how their each particular agency was going to become more open. And um, so, there's certainly been federal precedent that we've been paying attention to and following right, right from the beginning. I was hired in January 29th of 2009, so shortly after Obama was inaugurated and right from the get-go was able to uh, follow this federal precedent. So openness of the federal government, uh, the federal government has meant a lot of different things and um, honestly it's still to some degree being figured out, but first and foremost, uh, putting a lot of data online um, was one of the uh, most obvious initial uh, things that was done because uh, it, it was very difficult to find out some basics, basics like who spends what on what. 
um, and let alone sort of analyze budgets in order to uh, look for opportunities uh, for, for new efficiencies. So um, there's USA spending.gov is coming. The IT dashboard uh, uh, is, helps uh, Vivek Kundra and Anish Chopra look at where the government spends money on information technology. Um, there's another aspect of open government, though, which um, I think of as uh, participatory government. And um, that uh, an early example of that was Obama's um, Open for Questions, where he solicited uh, questions online. People voted on what questions they wanted to have him answer directly, live. Um, and then he answered the most popular questions. So it's a very simple example of not just uh, deciding what are the top five things that uh, we in the White House would like to talk about, but asking people what they would like uh, the White House, or in this case, the, the President, to talk about. Um, and so it certainly relates to openness, but it's a, it's a different version of it than publishing your data. Um, more recently, the Sunlight Foundation, um, which uh, is one of the, the, the real leading nonprofit organizations uh, pushing government transparency and openness, um, in particular at the federal level, but now increasingly at, at other levels as well. Uh, worked with uh, Representative Steve Israel in New York to introduce the Public Online Information Act, or the POIA. And that uh, act would essentially require um, all government information uh, that is foilable, to oversimplify a little bit, um, to be published online uh, proactively. So rather than having to go and uh, you know, uh, submit a freedom of information law request to get something out of the government, it would already be there. And obviously you can imagine the, the potential e efficiencies in having that be the status quo. Obviously there's some potential um, challenges to getting that to be the status quo, even if the law were passed. A lot of agencies aren't necessarily in the position, just from an IT management perspective, to publish all of their data, um, let alone in a standard, easy to access, easy to understand form. Um, there are also some great work going on at the local level. Uh, Open Uni is a, is a community of, of people and organizations. Um, the Open Planning Project and Code for America being a couple of them, which came out of a, a conference in Chicago called City Camp. And basically that's an effort for people doing open government work at the local municipal level in the cities to meet each other and to figure it out together rather than having everybody go off and figure it out on their own. Um, in order to try to, to come up with some ability to leverage off of each other's work, and in order to also uh, start to define standards by which open government could be done at the municipal level. Um, again, in service of hopefully doing it better, doing it faster, doing it more efficiently, and having the ultimate potential result be that much more, more powerful. So this is the context. I, I gave through all that because this is the context in which we've been doing our work in the New York State Senate over the past year. There's a lot of great stuff going on. Um, and that's been uh, a very important, I think, very empowering for us to be able to accomplish what we've accomplished over the last year. Um, so what we came into in the New York State Senate, um, which is you know, one of the two houses of the legislature in, in New York State, um, was truly an institution in need of, of uh, opening up. Um, this is the, uh, the former majority leader. He was the majority leader for about 15 years prior to, prior to 2009. Um, and he was indicted uh, uh, recently on three federal corruption charges for literally running a business out of his Senate office and literally having his you know, Senate employees paid for by our tax dollars being the administrative staff for that business. Okay, So, I mean, it's ab abject corruption, um, at least in the eyes of the jury. Um, so uh, and these are two other senators. Um, who decided to change political parties in the middle of last year. So after one political party uh, took over um, in January of 2009, which led to my hiring, after the other political party had been in power for 44 years before that, um, that uh, new party being in control of the Senate was thrown into question for about a month last summer um, because these two senators said, hey, no, I'm going to go be part of the other party now. And in the way the New York State Senate works, whoever, whichever party is in control runs the whole place. Literally, they hire and fire uh, the vast majority of the staff, they have the vast majority of control over the budget of the Senate, and they have full control over the ability to introduce laws and get, get, really get bills passed. So um, because it's a very narrow majority, 32 in one party and 30 in the other, two of them flipping uh, through that, into, uh, that control into question, and then it went to a legal battle because of some procedural details. Long story short, these two people decided not to change parties, and so, um, so I'm still here in front of you today. Um, but this is the context in which I, we are doing this work. Um, 
And the point of all that really being, oh, one last thing. More recently, that one of those senators got expelled by his colleagues because he was uh, convicted of uh, slashing his girlfriend with a, a broken glass, and his colleagues decided that that conduct was unbecoming even of the New York State Senate. So, um, you know, and all, all that means is that you know, uh, there's a lot of attention paid in New York State Senate within New York State and sometimes nationally, uh, but not often for the things that really matter to New Yorkers, right? And there's a lot of really important work, whether it be trying to close a $9 billion state budget deficit or, um, you know, having a vote on, on gay marriage or what have you, um, marriage equality, however you want to want to um, characterize it. And, and that really ought to, we think in the eyes of most citizens and most senators, be the work of the Senate and be what it's known for. Whether you agree or disagree with any particular issue, legislatures are there to make laws, right? And to be of service to their constituents. And there's precious little attention paid uh, in recent history to that in the New York State Senate. So um, we think that has something to do with the fact that the institution was under the control of one political party. And as I said, it's a very sort of dictatorial control in a sense where the majority party is able to do pretty much anything that they want, um, and uh, that control hadn't been in the other party's hands, the party that's now in power since about uh, 1965. So back in 1965, uh, you know, Bella Abzug was one of the first uh, women running for Congress. That was a computer, you know, there in the background, which is less powerful than, than this by far. That's Malcolm X up there in the, the gallery of the New York State Senate. Um, so a lot has changed since then, obviously, but not a lot had changed in the realm of, of technology and information management. Um, this is a, a slight exaggeration, but, but since 1965. Just a couple of examples. This is the news clips service, and every morning, uh, staff would come in at about 5 in the morning, take the paper newspapers from around New York State, take an X-Acto knife, cut out the articles, paste them on a piece of paper, put them into a, a scanner copier, and turn it into a, you know, a, a, a clip file of dozens and sometimes hundreds of pages, and then they would print hundreds of copies of those and distribute them to every Senate office. And the total cost of that was about a million and a half dollars a year to do that whole very paper and labor intensive operation, okay? Um, this is the, the constituent relationship management system, um, which is not a green screen, but pretty darn, it's got a couple colors in there, but it's, it's a command line interface. And this is how senators manage their relationships with their constituents. This is how they take, keep track of information about their constituents who you are, what you asked them to do, when you came, last came to visit in their office, what, um, you know, what uh, district you, you vote in, all that kind of stuff. So a fairly antiquated system. Um, this is the website. Uh, although they, when I got hired, they put up a picture of the, of the new guy, who was the, the majority leader at the time. The rest of it was the way the old website was. Um, you know, totally fine website, but extremely what we think of as Web 1.0. So it's a, it's, a, it's a brochure. You know, there's some information on it. A few people in the Senate could post information to it, but um, you were not able to do much with it in terms of interacting with it. Um, and so we were hired, and we were hired because the new majority that was voted in in November of 2008 and took over in January of 2009 uh, was voted into office uh, in large part because of their, they said, this institution is not where it should be, it should be better, we're going to reform it. And a big part of that is government transparency or, or openness and accountability to the citizens of New York. And then they actually had to figure out how to do that. And um, one of the uh, people that 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 you that uh, you worked with at the uh, Personal Democracy Forum was asked, "How do we do that?" And um, because he's a well-known sort of technology leader and political leader in New York, and he said, "You've got to hire a chief information officer, or a chief technology officer." He'll he or she will tell you how to do that. And so serendipitously, um, they found me, and I was hired, and I had to figure out how to do that. And so we uh, charged ourselves uh, in a, a sort of brief iterative conversation with Senate leadership with doing three things. Um, one, making the legislature more transparent. So you, opening it up, sunshine, making, letting people know what is going on, because for a long time it had been a very opaque institution where it was very difficult to find out what was going on inside the Senate. Um, making it really efficient, right? It was a, a terrible economic climate um, and constituents really needing help from their government at the same time a real imperative not to spend any more money than you have to to deliver that service. Um, and more participatory, you know, giving citizens uh, um, by and large, I don't think, felt like they had a voice in, in Albany, the, the capital of New York. And we said that that is part of the parcel of transparency, not just opening the government up, but also inviting people in. 
Okay, so those are the, the three the, the three things that we did. And we had to decide then what to do and on what basis to do it. I mean, we could have we could have done anything. We could have made the website better. We could have made the that constituent relationship management system better. We could have you know thrown away old uh, uh, antiquated computers that that cost a lot of money to maintain. There are a lot of different things we could have done. Um, we could have trained staff to use wikis or Twitter, what have you, and we had to have some criteria for figuring out where to start. Um, so we just came up with a, a, a checklist and said, you know, I, and I can go through every bullet point, but you know, we wanted sort of high impact, you know, quick to execute and very inexpensive to do projects so that we could actually start to move the ball, so we could actually start to, to cause change and to learn from that experience about what it was going to take to do it in this institution, which had very little experience in terms of its sort of institutional memory and its culture with, with doing these kinds of things. And so um, out of that, we came up with uh, you know, a few priorities for the first six months based on those criteria that I, that I put up before and that, that mission that I put up before. Um, we said, okay, we're going to start with the website. Uh, we're going to look at policy issues that uh, may stand in the way of creating a more open and a more participatory and a more efficient legislature. Um, we're going to use the tools that constituents are using to communicate with one another, namely social media and social networks. Um, we're going to help people internally to get to know each other better and to work together better because we felt like there was a lot of inefficiency, not just in communication with the outside world, but in terms of communication within the institution. Okay, um, and obviously, first and foremost, we had to make sure that the data, the information about what the Senate did was out into the light of day so that there could be transparency um, and oversight of what the Senate did. And then we said, on top of all that, we want, well, we want to spend less money to do that than has ever been spent before on technology because um, we felt like by setting that bar, we'd be forcing ourselves to meet that efficiency goal, not just that transparency goal. And a lot of uh, I've been in uh, uh, public hearings in uh, New York City where the uh, New York City was, uh, representatives were testifying that they, they couldn't they couldn't publish a certain amount uh, set of data because it would be very expensive, right? It would take a lot of money and time to get that information into a form in which it could be published. And we wanted to make sure that we wouldn't be subject to the same charge or the same impediment where you know, we, in a tough budget environment, we, we're going to ask for a million dollars to publish this information because it's important to do. We didn't think that that would fly. Okay, so we're starting with transparency, um, the first of those sort of three bullets in the mission. Um, sorry, go ahead. Can I ask you a question on the previous yep. slide? So when you were determining the priorities, I mean, clearly you were working with the government, but yep. were you also surveying the population to see what they wanted? Um, great question, I'll get to a little bit later. Long story short, not really at, in this very first stage. Uh, very shortly thereafter, uh, after we executed our first project, which I'm going to talk about now, um, we uh, did explicitly, uh, we hosted a, an unconference in the Capitol um, called Capitol Camp, in which we invited people to come in and take a look at our first project and evaluate it for us, help us to figure out where to go from there. Uh, but we felt like when we first came in, we, we had so little credibility and so little institutional knowledge ourselves because we were brand new in it um, that we didn't feel like we could uh, even effectively represent the institution we were now working for to any external group of citizens. We kind of had to become part of it and do something within it first. Um, so I guess the answer is not, not immediately but very explicitly right after our first project once we felt like we sort of were, were the institution and had, had actually done something. Um, so this is that first project. We decided you know that, that web 1.0 website just doesn't cut it. Uh, we're going to turn it into a, a government 2.0 website, and this is what resulted. And so we started this work really in uh, late January of, of 2009. We launched the site in the beginning of May of 2009. Um, we were ready to go a while before that, but uh, we uh, had a tough logistical scheduling um, process to actually get the Senate Majority Leader bill to go make the announcement saying, hey, here's our new Senate website. We delivered on part of what we said we would do, and we got elected. Um, so we were ready to go, uh, you know, early in April actually, and so it was a pretty tight time frame, late January to early April, from uh, from scratch to development of this new site, and this is what resulted. Um, first off, we we changed the URL from uh, senate.state.ny.us to nysenate.gov because we wanted it to be more memorable, easier to say, shorter to type, all those good things. Um, we wanted to. Um, um, and we also wanted to sort of put a stamp on the ground, a stake in the ground saying, this is new, <laughs> this is different. This is not the same institution we've been used to for 44 years. Um, so anyway, the, the site has uh, you know, everything you might expect, really. Um, it's got a lot of content about the Senate as an institution. 
Um, we focus a lot, though, on senators themselves, because the senators really are the institution. There's 62 of them, 32 representing one party, 30 representing the other. Um, historically, they had had, the Senate had had one website, and the senators had had a separate website provided by a third-party vendor that had some very close political ties to one of the parties. Um, and uh, senators from one party basically got access to some really good tools for their sites, and senators from the other party didn't. Um, even though they're all paid for by tax dollars, and we wanted to make it very clear that everybody was going to get the same tools, the same access to technology to communicate with their constituents, regardless of political affiliation. So we said, we are going to directly provide now, not just a website for the Senate, but we're going to provide websites for all the senators, right? Um, so and this is an example of one of those, Senator Eric Adams. And uh, from his standpoint, the standpoint of his staff and constituents, this is really his website. Right, the only up in the top right it has a link back to the Senate homepage. But uh, when you're in this environment, it's all his stuff, okay? And it's his staff who are managing the content on this website. It's it's his biography, it's his newsroom, it's his photos and videos, etc. Um, so uh, yeah. anyway, there are 62 of these microsites within that macro site. What platform are you running all this on? So that sure. Sure, so this is uh, based on Drupal, which is an open source con uh, uh, content management system, uh, the same one which, after us, the, wi the White House launched their uh, whitehouse.gov on, um, and uh, D-R-U-P-A-L. Um, it's, really, it's one of the leading open source content management systems, and um, you know, could, we could have used another, but this is a great one, and I could, you know, it's a, a separate conversation to talk about why we made that choice, but um, it was very important, we felt, from the standpoint of uh, efficiency to use an open source platform because we didn't want to be dependent on any third party vendor to pay licensing fees to in perpetuity, especially because historically the Senate had done that and the, the third party commercial firm providing it had politi you know, a political sort of agenda, uh, or at least there was a perception of that. So in this way, you know, the Senate owns this as much as anyone else. There's no company that owns the software. Uh, it's open source software. And we didn't have to, to pay anything for it. We paid a consultant to help us to initially develop it. Um, we also did the same thing for committees. Now, Previously, there had been no websites for committees at all. There'd be no, no, really no information about committees online anywhere. Um, and the committees are really where the, the sausage making, if you will, of making laws happens, right? That's where a proposed law gets introduced, gets debated. Uh, people get uh, invited to come publicly comment on it in public hearings and uh, ultimately voted on by a committee, a subset of the senators, and then if uh, it's uh, voted uh, yes, then it goes to the full Senate for consideration, right? So um, it's pretty fundamental, and uh, historically it was very difficult to find out who was on a committee, where a committee met, let alone you know, when to show up if you actually wanted to hear what was happening or actually have a voice in it. Um, and so we felt like a <coughs> comprehensive website with all of that information for every committee was a really important thing. Um, also, uh, we made sure that uh, there were universal calendars for all the events. You know, a lot of the Senate's work happens in events, whether it's a Senate session where a senator is actually on the Senate floor debating and voting on, bill, on laws, or whether it be a press conference about an issue, or whether it be one of those public hearings that I just referred to. And so we make sure that it's really easy to find whatever's happening in any given day, um, that it's easy to search for things you know, by committee, by senator, by event type, uh, et cetera. And then you can, of course, click through and see a lot of more detailed information about each event. Um, we also stream uh, pretty much all the Senate events live now because Albany is about two and a half hours north of Manhattan where half the population of New York State lives. And uh, it's a very beautiful ride on Amtrak, but um, those of us who have day jobs outside of the government don't often, unless you're a uh, registered lobbyist, don't often have time to go to Albany to actually have a voice or to see what's going on to exercise oversight. Um, so being able to be virtually there was fairly fundamental, we felt. Um, and so now we live stream all Senate sessions, all committee uh, public hearings, all formal committee meetings. Um, and so this is an example of one of the more high profile events, uh, which uh, was the marriage equality debate, which uh, took place last year. Ultimately, the bill was voted down, but um, we had about 15,000 people watching it live who otherwise wouldn't have been able to see what senators were saying, would have seen a, you know, a five minute uh, you know, news segment on the news. And, well, 15,000 may not seem like a lot, you know, it's not White House scale for us is a really big deal. You know, 15,000 people had never witnessed anything the Senate had done live ever in history, right? Um, and uh, not only that, but we did it in a way where, you know, it's, this is not rocket science anymore. You know, those, those little icons up at the top right are social bookmarks where I can just click that F icon and, um, oops, it's going to be later, but anyway, 
uh, it got passed around on Facebook, on Twitter, to a lot of people, such that a lot of people outside of New York State who had never heard of nysenate.gov but cared a lot about the marriage equality issue um, found out about it. And out of that, in particular, one senator, Diane Savino from Staten Islands, uh, gave a particularly passionate, uh, really compelling speech. And her speech was, since all of these videos that go on YouTube after the event is over, um, her speech got passed around by a lot of uh, marriage equality advocacy organizations and hundreds of thousands of people had viewed her speech within a week. And now she's sort of a social media starlet who had never been heard of really by anybody beyond uh, New York State or by some measures beyond Staten Island before that. So um, that was a really interesting experience for, for her certainly and, and for all of us to, to go through in terms of you know, why, why this matters, how this can make, can make an impact. Any question? Um, <clears throat> so before you guys started doing this, was this, like, were there videos being recorded of all the proceedings? Or would it be the ones who started recording? Um, there were the Senate sessions where senators are on the floor debating and voting about bills. Those were uh, streamed live previously, not archived and posted anywhere. Um, but you could, you could watch those live online. That was the one uh, type of event you could watch live. No committee meetings, no committee hearings, um, and no archives. And who's updating all these micro sites? Um, great question, and uh, we'll get to that a little bit more later, but uh, we trained uh, more than 100 staff in the Senate who are non, not technical staff. They're the staff of the committees, the staff of the senators to actually directly manage their own content. It would not have been, we don't have a very big staff, it would not have been sustainable for us to manage all of this content. So we said, we're going to do the technical work, we're going to make the people that are closest to the actual work of the lawmaking, um, and the people actually work directly for the senators and the committees, we're going to put them in the driver's seat to manage their own content. Um, and no, that hasn't been a, a perfect process. There are some people who are much, you know, everyone's busy. Um, there are some people who say, no, just do it, do it for me. And we really had to sort of take a, you know, a, a hard line in terms of saying, no, you know, we're not, we don't manage content. We do the technology and we empower you to have a direct voice and interaction with, with your constituents. And some senators are much more active about that and they're using their website, you know, many, many times every day to post new content. Others are not doing much with it. And the beauty of it is that, you know, Every senator can have their own their own approach, their own workflows, and decide what's important to them. And we don't really mandate that. Um, so you'll see a, a great range among the 62 senators. Um, okay, so the Senate-wide stuff, though, that had nothing to do with any s senator in particular, uh, which was fundamental to transparency, was also one of the main points of, of rolling out a new website. And um, Chiefly to me, that means opening up the data, right? So regardless of what press release I put out or what spin I put on a particular issue, the data is the data. And uh, important things like what we all get paid, uh, what senators are, what the Senate as an institution is spending money on, uh, particularly an institution that was previously being run like a business, um, is important and fundamental to sort of putting, putting the reality behind the rhetoric of transparency and accountability. Right? So we sort of modeled this loosely on data.gov at the federal level where you can uh, easily post information in a variety of uh, data sets in a variety of formats, um, you know, search on them by a variety of criteria, um, and make it really easy to find what you're, what you're looking for. Um, and that easy to find and publishing in a variety of, of formats is really important because I can say, you know, hey, we publish all of our expenditure data, but if it's a, a and I've seen this, if it's a scanned PDF, or sorry, it's a scanned document uh, meaning that it's literally not, it's not even a, a, a PDF that's from a Word document you actually do a text search in, like literally an image that you can't do a text search within. How am I going to go through thousands and thousands, or who's going to have the time to go through thousands and thousands of lines of expenditures to actually look for the needle in the haystack of something that might actually be a problem? Um, not that easy. So we are in, uh, working hard to make sure that we publish in a variety of formats, searchable, sortable, formats so that you can actually you know, go into Excel or what, what have you and, and actually uh, do the analysis that, is, that makes the data relevant in the first place to, to have be publicly available. Um, the other major area of open data is legislation, right? It's what the Senate chiefly does. Um, previously there was a, a, a system called the Legislative Research Service and that was um, very explicitly for, for, for professionals. Senators and their staff get access to it for free gives you some very uh, sophisticated search criteria. You know, you can search by a lot of different, you know, complex queries and set up alerts for yourself. So it's, it's pretty good in many ways. But the problem was, uh, if you didn't work for the Senate, you had to pay thousands of dollars to get access to it. So the government was selling its access to its legislative data as a revenue stream, right? 
Um, and some people said that's because we need to make money, we don't want to spend tax dollars to do this, people will pay us for it. Other people, um, the more cynical of us, said, you know, it's actually in order to limit the audience who that can actually know what's going on and participate to the professionals, to the in, inside baseball people, if you will, who actually care enough to and potentially have a financial stake enough in what's going on to actually be willing to spend that money to get access to the information. So it was chiefly lobbyists and media organizations that were subscribers to the Legislative Research Service. Um, and they had access to, to good data. Um, the other aspect of it was, you know, it was the way it was presented was very, uh, very technical. You know, really had to be a policy professional in order to, to find what you're looking for and to understand what was going on. And we said that that's not good enough, right? This is these are laws that are being made in a way that affects all of us as citizens, whether we're uh, incredibly, you know, policy wonkish or whether we're real, uh, you know, policy luddites. And so our goal is to make all this information online and available and, and free but also to make it really easy and intuitive to find. So sort of Google is our, is our, uh, our goal for that, sort of Google-friendly, Google-easy. And I don't think we're there yet, but we're, we're a lot of the way there. So you know, a single search box, if you go to open, openlegislation.nysenate.gov, you'll see a single search box, and just type in what you're looking for. Um, you know, keywords, uh, you can do complex queries if you want within that for date ranges and senator names and whatnot. And it'll auto-suggest what you might be looking for. So if I type in Mary, you'll get that same marriage equality bill popping up as the most likely relevant search result, right? And then if you click through, you get to all of the gory details of the bill. Um, you know, who the sponsor is, what the equivalent bill in the other house of the legislature, the assembly is, uh, what committee it came from, the rules committee, um, what section of state law it relates to, um, you know, what actions had to happen to get to the point where it was voted on on the Senate floor, and very importantly, who voted for it and who voted against it. And believe it or not, that was historically very difficult to find out. Um, and if you were to scroll down further, you'd see the bill text and all that, all that good stuff. Um, so that was our other sort of open data transparency stake in the ground. Um, any questions about that? Yeah. Has this replaced the other system, or is it just in addition to it? No, it's interesting. So the Legislative Research Service is run by a, a joint commission of the Assembly and the Senate, the two houses of the legislature. And um, it still does some things, I think, for professionals better than our system does because our, we're, we're targeting 20 million New Yorkers and they're targeting a few thousand professionals. Um, so for now, I think they're complementary. Um, there's a little bit of uh, healthy or unhealthy, depending what perspective you have, competition going on because uh, you know, there, uh, there's a potentially a, a business and revenue threat to, of our system to their business. Um, in particular, in, in, you know, some of the things they don't do at all by design is that there are no permanent URLs in their bills. So uh, this has a permanent URL. You can put it in a blog post. You can uh, you know, put it in any sort of media. You can email it to your friends, and they'll have direct access to the same information. On the Legislative Research Service, there are no URLs. The pages are generated on the fly, and that's kind of by design. So you, can only get the, you can't take that information out of the walls of LRS and pass it around. You, can only, you have to pay and go to LRS to do it. So, um, you know, what's going to happen there long term? I don't know. They make a certain amount of revenue that the legislature would rather not have to uh, make up. Uh, and they do provide some functions beyond the legislative research service in terms of management of the information about bills. Mm -hmm. They are the sort of the neutral third party in between the Senate and the Assembly who says this actually was passed by both houses of the legislature. It actually can become, you know, go to the governor and become law. Um, so there's a, there's a valuable function uh, there. It just not, uh, may or may not necessarily need to be forever also providing a, a public website. Um, you know, their curation of the data might be all that they need to do. In fact, this data comes from them, right? So we worked with them to take their proprietary format of data that they would put into their website, the Legislative Research Service, turn it into XML, which is an open standard that we were able to use to publish, to, to consume their data and republish it in this more friendly form. And then we also, if you look up at the top uh, where it says, uh, Developers, we have a, an API or an application programming interface on top of this that enables people to take the same underlying data that we use to build these web pages and use it to build their own web applications. And people have actually done that. So we have had developers that we have not had to have any formal relationship with who've taken this data and have built a like a voice phone interface to it. So you can like call up and say, "Hey, I want to find out about Bill six six zero zero three, and you'll, it'll read the bill to you. That kind of thing. So um, the nice thing about that is we don't have to do all the work. We don't have to come up with all the ideas. You know, maybe that's a useless idea, I don't know, but we certainly wouldn't have been able to do it on our own, and we don't have all the good ideas, we certainly don't have all the staff to do that work. So um, publishing the data 
as well as publishing a good intuitive interface to the data uh, is, is really important um, and empowering to, uh, we think, to a lot more people when you publish the data in a form that other people can then make use of in the way that they see fit. And I'll get into that a little bit more about why that's important and sort of the best practice. Um, so participation, we look at this, as I alluded to at the beginning, as sort of the, 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 uh, the fundamental corollary or, uh, to transparency. You know, what, what good is, is transparency, having data out there, if you don't actually have people finding it, making use of it, right? It's just out there. Um, and in turn, without how can you participate effectively in government if you don't know what's going on, if it's not transparent, right? So we really look at these as, as two halves of a whole. Um, so what we did in that regard, I'd say we're much less far along in this, but it's, it's now our, our prime focus. Um, we said, you know, let's not make this a one-way street of us publishing data, let's invite people to participate. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you know, public comment on all bills. We're the first legislative body in the country to invite public comment on all bills, right? This is before the bills pass, as well as after they pass or don't pass. Um, and so you can go say what you will about it, right? And um, some senators love this and are looking at every comment on their bills, and other senators really could care less. But again, that's okay, right? At the end of the day, there's more. Uh, there's an easy. It's easier to get a seat at the table if you're not physically in Albany. If you know about an issue, you may not care about any other law, but you may care about a particular issue or have expertise in a particular issue, and now you have a really easy way to share that and contribute that. Um, and not only to contribute it as you would if you called your senator and told them what you think, but contribute it in a public, social way so that other people can see what you think and be influenced by that, or rebut what you have to say, what have you. Um, so technologically not difficult, policy-wise and precedent-wise, it was, was pretty groundbreaking at the time. And we've had some really interesting stuff out of this. Like, uh, the marriage, you know, medical use of marijuana is a very high-profile issue, as is marriage equality. Uh, you know, the regulations governing the use of wood stoves in New York State is not, or, or uh, what what uh, what chemicals can be used in nail polish. Those are not not as high-profile issues. But some of the best comments we've gotten, in our opinion, have been about those issues because there are narrower communities of people that are really experts in these issues and really care about them, like the people who install wood stoves for a living. And we've had people writing in saying, this part of this law makes no sense, and here's why. I do this for a living. And we don't have people that install wood stoves for a living working for the Senate and writing those laws, right? So they actually need that input. That actually is valuable to them. And ideally, this ultimately results in not only uh, sort of a, a real-time opinion poll for senators to decide whether they should vote yes or no, but ultimately in better laws in, at the end of the day. Okay? So along similar lines, for some high-profile issues, and this is totally experimental, but, but we think has a lot of promise. Um, you know, we put up what we call ideas crowdsourcing portals. And the idea being that on really high profile issues where we really need help, um, like you know, campaign finance, a big complex issue with lots of, lots of uh, opinions about it, um, we actually, before there's even a bill drafted, will say, you know, what do you think about this? What should we do? How can we make it better? Which, which, which law out of the dozen that are being considered is most important? And how would you write it? And so we put out this invitation, say, you know, submit your idea about this issue, and then vote on each other's ideas, up or down, and the good stuff floats to the top, is the idea. The, stuff, the, the, the proposals, if you will, the ideas that have the most votes, come up to the top. And that makes it easy for a senator, um, who represents 250 or 300,000 people, to actually be able to participate in this and pay attention, because they only have to pay attention to the top you know, however many ideas, rather than going through the hundreds or maybe even thousands if we're successful in the future ideas that are submitted. So that idea of crowdsourcing or sort of collaboratively filtering information, um, we think is very powerful um, because ultimately we're the, the traditional method of constituent interacting with a senator is not scalable for a senator. If you represent 250, 300,000 people, you can't talk to every one of them. You can't meet with every one of them. And that's I think in some, for some, that's, that's part of the reason why senators tend to pay attention to people who give them a lot of money or people that have a lot of influence and are perceived to be very politically powerful. It's not just because they don't care about other people, it's because that's, that's all they can handle, right? They can't do it any other way with traditional means. This is another way that can potentially give a lot of people a voice, but by aggregating their voices into something that a senator can make sense of and actually pay attention to, it could in, in be a proxy for the opinions of a lot more of us. Um, and so that, we think, is, is pretty exciting. Um, so another uh, part of participation is making sure that uh, it's easy to share, as I alluded to. A lot of people are never going to come to nysenate.gov. They've never heard of it. But they care a lot about the marriage equality issues. So I said before, you know, that the video of that debate got passed around to a lot of people. 
that was just easy to do because of this, you know, the F icon up there. I would click it, and it was, goes on to my Facebook uh, profile. So people who know me have an opinion about me. Am I really smart or stupid or you know corrupt or have a lot of integrity? If I bother to put something there, they're going to see not only that, where they might never even heard of nysenate.gov, but they're going to see that in the context of me and who I am and what I'm saying about it. And that's, uh, we think, a you know, very important context for people. If they're actually going to get involved in government, they need to get involved in government through the people and the communities that they're already part of, that they already care about, that they already have a trust relationship with. So the, using the social web in that way um, and having the website of the institution be a publishing platform for content that then goes all over the social web um, is, is really important. Um, Senators are doing that directly as well. Um, sometimes, you know, very eagerly, sometimes a little bit of our controlling. Um, we make it very easy at least to go click on the senator tab up in the top left, see the list of all the senators, and then see who's doing what. Uh, so, you know, senators that are using Twitter and Facebook have those icons there. Senators that are not, do not. Um, and you can go directly to their Twitter feeds or Facebook. And we've got more than 50% of senators now using uh, these social media platforms. Uh, and the, Usage of them was, was very, very small before this all started. There's just an example of one senator who's you know, carrying on sometimes very, very candid and outspoken uh, conversations with, with his constituents on Facebook. Um, hashtags are important on Twitter. Uh, we, again, had a, a pretty tough brand in senate.state.ny.us and also New York Senate. Nobody really knew if that, you know, is that uh, Hillary Clinton and, and uh, Kristen Gillibrand are US senators or is that something else? Um, and so we've worked very hard to say it's, it's NY Senate. Anywhere you go on the web, if you put in NY Senate, you're going to find the content of the New York State Senate. And it's also quick and easy to type, uh, which is important for the web. And so now, if on Twitter, uh, you know, you put the hashtag hash NY Senate uh, onto anything you're writing about that relates to the New York State Senate, and then it makes it much easier for other people to find out what is going on. And this has really become the real-time pulse, the news pulse of the New York State Senate. So when this legal battle was going around around uh, last summer about who was going to control the Senate, these two senators were deciding which, which party to be part of. Uh, the people in the courtroom actually seeing what the judge was saying, like, is, are the, is one party going to take over or not? Uh, the, the way that people were finding out about that was on Twitter. Um, and the use of the NY Senate hashtag has, has really enabled that. So, um, you know, all that sounds great to most of us, but there are a lot of people I think very legitimately ask, uh, so what? And um, or, as I alluded to at the beginning, uh, is it worth it? You know, is it, how much does it cost? It's, it's a lot of new work for some very busy people in a very busy institution at a very critical time, where really they need to be focused on making laws. Um, so efficiency is the, is the uh, I, I think, where the, where the rubber meets the road. And um, so we focused also on developing internal systems that help make the Senate more efficient. So this is the new constituent relationship management systems. Uh, we're just in the process of rolling it out right now. Uh, but sort of looks and feels much more like the web. Um, we also designed it in a way that uh, not only is it going to kind of do what senators are used to doing with constituents today, which is managing their correspondence with their constituents, uh, making it easy to record. You know, this constituent called me or this constituent emailed me, and they said they support this issue. Um, but also building it as what we call a social CRM, so that uh, all this that we've seen happening out on the social web, on Twitter, on Facebook, on comments on the uh, legislative website, um, the, all that information will get into this system as well. So senators will be able to go in and say, OK, you know, Joe came into my office today. What has he been saying about this issue all over the web? And have a much easier time to find that out. Um, and thereby, we hope, a much, uh, find it much easier to represent that constituent well. Yeah? Is there a way to find out um, aggregate everything that's being said about that senator? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's the idea. It, we're still, you know, we're still sort of in the process of figuring out the best way to do that. Um, but that's where the sort of the consistent branding and sort of naming conventions of things have been important. Um, you know, it's easy for us to go find content on the web that's tagged, if you will, with NY Senate. Uh, we also have these these uh, uh, standard URLs and you know, well-defined XML that means that any bill that uh, like that marriage equality bill, if you go to Google, you'll find that very high up in the search results. It's got good search engine optimization for all the content that we publish. That makes it, in turn, much easier. If somebody then goes and puts that URL into a blog post, and then somebody comments on that blog post, makes it much easier for us to build systems that will then find that content and pull it in as metadata, which then is attached to constituent records in the constituent relationship management system. So uh, I'd say we're sort of like part of the way there, not all the way there, but we've developed these systems with 
very much with that in mind, making it easy for these to be sort of you know, information dashboards for senators about what's going on. Okay. Is yeah. Uh, so, uh, it's also uh, an open source? Or? Yeah, this yeah. is also an open source CRM. Um, that was one of our a much tougher decision than for the website because uh, open source CRMs, uh, you know, I could talk to you about it for, for an hour, um, are uh, less mature, I think, than the open source content management systems that run websites. Um, so we took, a, a, you know, honestly, a bit of a calculated risk here that, again, it would be fiduciarily responsible and important for the Senate to not be dependent on any single third-party company to s s pay you know, six or seven, even seven-figure licensing fees to in perpetuity. And this system is so fundamental to what the senators do every day and to the institution's day-to-day -day work that we felt like uh, locking ourselves in any platform, unless we absolutely had no choice, um, any platform that we didn't own, if you will, um, was, was a bad idea. So we worked very hard to evaluate whether we had an open source choice, and we feel like we, we found one that, um, that uh, and we were able to prove its scalability, its sort of technical viability to, to work for us. That's Uh Bluebird is our name for it. Uh, it's a New York State bird, so um, that's ours. But uh, the platform is called CiviCRM, C-I-V-I-C-R-M. Um, it's used and integrated tightly with a lot of uh, websites that run Joomla and Drupal. So this idea of sort of blurring the lines between the CRM as an internal application and the website as an external application is uh, sort of in the, in the DNA of how this CRM is built. So this idea of a social CRM that kind of puts information out to the web and brings information back from the web um, is uh, much more viable with this CRM platform than with some other CRM platforms that were developed more to, to sell stuff, um, which is the, the history of a lot of CRM platforms. So, uh, you know, I'll let you know how it goes. We're rolling it out right now, and uh, we're very optimistic, but uh, certainly I think that that was a calculated risk that we took. Um, the financials on it are dramatically, you know, we're, we're going to spend uh, less than one-tenth of what the New York City Council did to roll out a CRM system. Um, for you know, much much uh, well double the population essentially ultimately that whose data is going to be in it. So um, that'll be a great thing if we pull it off. It'll be terrible if we don't. But we wouldn't have done it if we didn't feel very confident in our ability to do it. So. When you're talking about these decisions, you're often talking about free open source versus commercial off the shelf. Mm -hmm. How big is your staff that's building things internally so not even feasible, or is it that you're very wary of getting tied to something that you then have to maintain? Yeah, I mean, essentially we are building these systems internally. I mean, sometimes, we're hiring, sometimes we're hiring consultants temporarily to sort of augment our, our staff, um, or because we're already busy every day with all the things that we do every day. Um, but uh, the idea ultimately is to be self-reliant self and be able to have our own staff maintain and extend these systems, both the website and the CRM and any software we develop, uh, frankly, and that's enable that's facilitated by being open source software. But building a CRM system or a, a content management system from scratch well, really doesn't make sense because management. these yeah, um, you know, these systems are, are quite specialized, but they're also quite mature. I mean, there are thousands of, uh, of enterprises that use these systems and these specific pieces of software. So building from scratch really wouldn't have made sense for are us. Doing anything custom specifically internal that you couldn't find? Already built somewhere? Um, extending both these platforms for sure. Building, you know, we if you ever used a system like Drupal, we've built new modules that that you know plug into Drupal and add a new way of doing a particular piece of functionality. Um, the other beautiful thing about it is that we then are able to share that. So we we contribute all of our code. I'll get into that later, but we contribute all of our code back to this this commons, if you will, of the communities of engineers that build these software products and make them better and better over time. So we can build something and then the White House could use it, and the White House could build something and we could use it, and neither of us would have any sort of legal or financial uh, impediment to that. Um, and ultimately, if you think about government, you know, across the board, you know, we've got, you know, tens of thousands of municipalities and 50 states and one country and, you know, however many hundreds of countries, I forget the number there are in the world, um, you know, our ability to help each other as government entities or nonprofit entities or even commercial entities um, with the economics of open source is is pretty exciting. And we want to be very much of a a, a partner and appear to, to as many other uh, government entities as we can in that regard. And we're certainly going to be making this available to any government entity that wants to use it. Uh, and you know, on our own time, we'll give sort of some free consulting, if you will. But uh, ultimately, it's the code is there for people to download and take and, and go with. Yeah. I have one minor who, who decides on the content and technology and whether you decide yourself or you need to have political uh, decisions? Yeah, um, it depends what aspect of it you're talking about. I mean, so for the uh, each senator, 
they would want to have total control over their website. So we just provide the tools and they put whatever they want on there. That said, there is an institution there which needs to set policies for what you can do and what you can't do. It's not illegal to use a government website to do fundraising for your political campaign, for example. So the chief administrative executive of the Senate, the so-called secretary of the Senate, has the policy purview to say, this is what you can do and this is what you can't do on the websites. But that's been very contentious, actually. There's a lot of disagreement among senators about what they can and can't do. And in the, at the federal level, in the uh, US House and Senate, that's why a lot of this work has been done more independently with each senator and representative fending for themselves more than we've done in the Senate. Um, because they don't, uh, what I've heard secondhand is that they don't want to be constrained by any institutional policy about what they can and can't do. And there's a lot of disagreement about what you can and can't do. The Federal General Services Administration, uh, GSA, administers the .gov domain names for all the .gov domains in the, in the world. They have a, a .gov domain policy which just says you can't use political party names. You know, these are government websites, they're not about politics. At U.S. Congress and U.S. Senate, uh, U.S. House and U.S. Senate, there's Republican, Democrat, this, that, all over. So they're not enforcing that policy. And we are debating internally what we can and can't do. Ultimately, we want it to be fair and equally applied across the board. Beyond that, we don't really care. Um, but that's a, that's a really good question and an ongoing you know, issue culturally inside the institution. Um, and as we make more and more powerful tools available, it becomes a more and more high stakes <coughs> for, for some of these folks. Okay. Um, just a couple other efficiency related things. Remember that, that uh, you know, Exacto Knife newspapers cut them out in the morning, at five in the morning, $1.5 million budget every year. Uh, we, just, we built a free, you know, simple web application to get uh, news feeds from the internet and to parse them and repackage them in a way that senators are used to seeing them. So each senator, you know, they're able to now just go to a website and see news about themselves uh, every morning. And it, it didn't cost us a dime to do that. It cost us some, some time to build it, but it doesn't cost us any money at all. So that's a net, you know, $1.5 million savings every year. Is this just running a Google or what? Uh, no, we actually got a, sort of a donation, if you will, of a, of a news feed service, a company called Daylife. Um, made, gave us, they already do this sort of packaging up of, of news feeds from all over the the, the world um, and have an API that enables us to build this. It's a Java-based site really easily. Um, so, uh, you know, we sort of, again, as the criteria I put up at the beginning, you know, quick to do, doesn't cost much, uh, and, um, and you know, visible, so you can actually show that you're, you're changing things. Um, this, you know, really qualified in that regard and is a real home run in terms of financial savings. Uh, we're also trying to get out of the business of doing en enterprise information technology that's not related to making laws. So we have a data center, we host servers, but we don't think necessarily we should be in that business forever. Um, we shouldn't be good at hosting servers. Um, so more and more uh, with appropriate sort of uh, considerations of privacy and security and legal separation of powers between different parts of government and between the public sector and the private sector, we're, we're doing at least our software development in the cloud, if you will, um, and hosting our public facing websites. The uh, the nysenate.gov and the open legislation website in the cloud, meaning they're not on our servers that we have to maintain, and if they crash, we don't have to physically go down and, and look at them. They're on uh, a commercial third-party hosting provider that is able to much more efficiently and economically uh, provide those services to the Senate than we'd be able to provide them to ourselves. So trying to get out of the business of doing some things that we've done historically, because the information technology world has moved to the point where it just doesn't make sense to do that anymore. Um, Along similar lines, you know, two years before I got there, the Senate bought 1,600 uh, IBM or Lenovo PCs, and every everybody has the same PC on their desk. Um, not surprisingly, a lot of people don't want to only work at their desk, and they don't want to necessarily work with that thing there in the lower left. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but more and more people work from wherever they are, and they want to work with the tools that they're used to and familiar with. Um, and some of them you know, do other things in life that are not related to government work and they want to not have to change computers to do their government work on the government computer and then their personal work on the personal computer and worry about which is on which. So um, increasingly people are using their own equipment and we're trying to, as an organization, support that. So making it easier for me to use my, my iPhone because I like it more, even though the Senate provides its senators with Blackberries, right? Um, and, and, and along similar lines, we want to make sure that 
not everything has to happen in Albany, that it's easier to support a distributed workforce. You know, citizens live all over the state, senators represent 62 districts around the state. We want to make it easier for people to do work from their communities, because that's where their work is most relevant. And uh, that requires people to be able to work on the go, people to work off hours, people to work physically, not just from Senate offices, but from anywhere. So that's just sort of modernizing our approach to providing enterprise information technology support in a way that we think is really uh, efficient and empowering to, to senators and staff to do a good job. Um, so I'm not going to go through all this, but this is sort of like we feel like we've accomplished a lot of things over the last 12 months. Um, I've, I've alluded to most of them before. Um, we, did, we did hit our, our uh, final bottom line of spending less money on information technology than the Senate has ever spent in any year for which we have, have data. Um, so we feel uh, great about having been able to do a lot of new things and being able to save money in the process of doing it. Sort of, um, to our mind, means that there's there, not that we did everything perfectly, but that it was worth doing this work. Um, so how do we do it? Uh, we hired some new people uh, who weren't weren't used to working in government and who came from sort of entrepreneurial technology backgrounds or you know, nonprofit, very mission driven. Uh, technology backgrounds, and these are some of those folks. But we also kept on the people that had been working in the Senate and information technology for a long time because they had the institutional knowledge of what works and what doesn't work and what might be hard to change, even if coming from the outside we think maybe naively that it would be easy to change. So to your question about how do you get people to, 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 uh, to, to do new things and who decides, uh, it's been very important for us to hold over people who worked for the Senate under a different political leadership. Um, so that we can bring that institutional knowledge as well as doing the new things that we've been doing with new people from outside of government. Um, it's also been important for us to do that because we want to make sure technology is not no longer a political thing. We didn't want it, or a partisan political thing. We didn't want it to be that, you know, here we're from this party and we just got hired and now, you know, forget about you all. We're just going to serve our people, uh, but rather to say these are services paid for by tax dollars that are really part of the part of the administrative support of the institution. Um, so old plus new. Okay, um, making aggressive goals and and stating them publicly, we felt like it's important because um, at, it, we, uh, we felt like it was important to set up consequences for for failure um, in order to have the leverage to cause change uh, and to do so quickly. Um, so there was a, a report put out in, in April by a, a joint bipartisan committee saying. This is how the Senate specifically is going to open up and become trans more transparent. Here's what we're going to do very specifically. And then we actually had to do it. We actually had to do the work to make it to, to uh, have the letter of what became the rules of the Senate uh, turn into reality. But it was very important to put that public stake in the ground. Because once you say we're going to publish all of our payroll information online in a searchable, sortable format, um, you kind of got to do it or else you're not going to get reelected, or at least that's, that's the implication. So. Making that public statement is very, was very important. Um, I alluded to policies before as, as well, um, and some policies needing to change to enable all this. Uh, copyright was one. Uh, at the state level, we can't assert copyright, unlike the federal level. Um, and so we felt like it was a, if we wanted people to take this content from this publishing platform, venwysenate.gov, and pass it all over the social web so that people would actually see it and actually uh, interact with it, we had to make an affirmative statement. We felt that you could do that because there were some people when we came in who said, "No, no, this is the, this is a Senate's content. You got to deal with it just here on nysenate.gov. You can't go put it in a blog post. You can't go make a poster with it and take it to your local high school. You can't create a lesson plan for a social studies curriculum in, a, in an elementary school using it um, because because it's ours." And um, so we adopted a, a, a the Creative Commons standard, and we're the, again the first legislature to, to do that. Um, which says basically you can do anything you want with any of the photos, videos, text uh, on our websites as long as you don't make a, pol a uh, political uh, attack ad with it or a political fundraising pitch with it because we felt like that mixing of government content created with tax dollars used for political, explicitly political purposes wouldn't be appropriate. Um, so uh, we feel like that's, that's very important for, for the success of, of the, the social web side of this. Uh, privacy can, policy. Can you, yeah. Thank you. Can you I mean, why um, can I just take the video and? So we may find out. We have an election this fall, <laughs> and there's a lot of. There never was much content online from the Senate before. Okay, so now there's a lot, and there's a very tough political election coming up in the fall. So we'll see what's going to happen. Certainly, we don't have a whole you know room full of uh, of uh, lawyers waiting to jump on this at all, right? Um, but 
we felt like at least you know, setting the standard of what was okay and not was the most important thing. Because really what we want to do is empower people to... A lot of people in the past would have taken this content and done what they wanted to with it anyway. But we wanted to, to draw a line and give some guidance, essentially, and say, this is, this is explicitly in, you know, great, and this is what we think you shouldn't do. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. I don't know if it's enforceable as a practical matter. Um, but I think it is at least enforceable in the sense of if somebody does something they're not supposed to do, that can turn into a negative news story, right? So there's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a, a, a potential repercussion for violating the policy, even if it's not a legal repercussion because it's so public. Uh, I'm sorry, in the same order of ideas, if I'm a big uh, person from, uh, no, from, from Cuba, uh, can I just jump in and start, like, saying that senator is crazy, I don't think that. Yeah, so that's our terms of participation. Um, and so when we, when you make comments on a, on a, uh, a, a bill, say on our legislation website, or on a blog post that a senator Makes. We, we do have those moderated right now, but we explicitly moderate them only for being uh, on topic, relevant. Like, you can't say, hey, I've got this great you know, business selling cars over here, and you're posting it on a medical marijuana <laughs> bill. That wouldn't be in the public interest to have that comment be sort of, you know, spam comments wouldn't be doing anybody any good. So we do moderate for that. Um, we also moderate for, you know, hate speech, you know, uh, curse, curse words, you know, things that, again, we feel like would distract from the, from the debate. But beyond that, we don't moderate at all for opinions. Um, is it a whole comment or just part of the comment? Uh, right now, it's, it's whole comment. Um, and then we make it very clear what you can and can't do in our terms of participation. We say, this is, if you're going to, you know, if you agree as a citizen by participating in this website to do these things and to not do those things. And we, mar we mirrored that really off what the White House uh, does. They've, they've broken the new ground on this. And we said, you know what, that's, that's good enough for us. We'll try it. And we're certainly opening to, open to iterating it. You know, some other public institutions have said, you know what, we're not going to moderate comments at all. And we're just going to let your citizens kind of be the comment police and be able to, you know, if three people say this comment is, is uh, you know, off topic, irrelevant, or offensive, or, or criminal, um, you know, then it gets flagged and the administrators can, can take it off. That's an approach other public institutions have taken. We took this one because we felt like we needed to be a little bit more conservative because a lot of senators are kind of wary of this stuff anyway. And they're not, they don't want to be attacked on their website. And so... Um, we felt like uh, this was the appropriate line to draw that was significantly empowering, changing a lot, but not changing so far that the institution might push back and say, no, don't do it, any of it because it's, it's too scary. So that's a line that we've had to walk, and the precedent of the White House has been really great for us in that regard because we're able to say, you know what, it's good enough for the White House, it's probably good enough for the New York State Senate. Yeah. This question, including a guy from Cuba, made me wonder, do you keep track of IP addresses, do you find that there are a lot of out-of-staters commenting on these things? You said that when um, the one thing went viral, the woman became sort of universally famous. Do the senators know where these comments are coming from, or do they pay more attention to ones that are clearly originating from inside New York, or not? Yeah, so good question. We, um, uh, I don't want to quite leave this yet, but I'll pull up later. We publish, we publish an analytics report, which gives a lot of stats, statistics about um, social media usage and website usage, and we publish that publicly in our open data portal, of course. And um, so there's a lot of information there. Uh, we don't monitor IP addresses or do that kind of thing. We do uh, also we have use a widget called uh, Chartbeat, which gives a lot of sort of real-time information. Like literally, you can see you know hit by hit what pages people are looking at on the website, um, which is which is pretty neat. So again, it's all across the board. Some senators are paying a lot of attention and even competing with one another to have the most Facebook followers. <laughs> Um, or Twitter followers or Facebook fans, um, and others, again, could, could care less. And that's all, I, again, our job, we think, is to make the information available, um, not in a sort of big brother, we're going to monitor our IP addresses kind of way, although if, you know, if, there were, if somebody made a death threat against the senator and it was a moderated comment, you know, we would do anything that we could, working with the appropriate authorities to, to track that down, but not as a well, not right as part now, of our job function. Right now, if legal medical marijuana growers in California decided to right. make a big push posing as New Yorkers, yeah. there'd, be, there'd be no... First off, there's not enough participation that it necessarily matters yet, but also there'd be no real way of knowing if your commenters are, in fact, constituents. Right. Uh, right. We are, actually, one, so one, of, the things we're, one of the things we're... we're Right. Yeah. One of the things we're we're thinking seriously about with the rollout of the CRM system is what role public profiles play, and actually the idea of giving people accounts and being able to have them control their information. You know, how much information do I want to share with my senator? Do I want to get uh, right right now? Most senators send out 
large volumes of paper mail to their constituents at taxpayer expense, you know, literally newsletters to hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and some people say that's great because they're able to keep people informed who don't use computers. Other people say that's terrible because most people throw them in the trash and they're essentially political propaganda paid for by tax dollars. That's the, that's the cynical view. And I'm not weighing in on either side. I think you know, multiple mediums for communication are important because we have citizens of all different backgrounds and stripes and linguistic abilities and ages and all the and accesses to technology and all that. But as a citizen, I'd love to be able to have some control over that and say, you know what, don't send me paper anymore. I'm going to throw it away and it's a waste of money and it's a waste of trees. Just send me an email and I'm happy to read your email. Or don't send me anything because I really don't care about you and I don't want to hear it. And if I want to find out about you, I'll go to the website. So um, it's not, it's only partially related to your question, but the idea of you know, giving citizens control over information, including being able to uh, potentially document that they are actually who they say they are and they actually live in New York and they're actually a constituent, and so I you should pay attention to what they're saying. Controlling our identities is pretty powerful. I yeah, think, right. Interesting. Right. So, and there are a lot of people, including yourself, I know are exploring how to do that, but um, you know, we don't necessarily have the best ideas, but we're certainly listening to, to how people are proposing to do that. Um, and with the, with the rollout of the CRM system, that's becoming a, a really hot issue for us is to figure out the best way to do that. You know, if I send an email to my senator, am I really that person? It's difficult to verify that right right now, and we would like to be able to do a better job of that. Um, so just a few more here. Um, again, your point about how, how to, ch how to uh, get these things to happen within an existing institution. External support for this is very important to actually getting the internal support for this, because there are a lot of people in the institution who care a lot about these things inherently, believe, believe they're important. There are other people who really, again, only care if people outside tell them that it's important um, and are sort of weighing, does it help make them look better or make them look worse? So having some pretty notable people, national leaders in sort of open, open government and technology circles, including you know, one guy here at Harvard, Larry Lessig, um, say that the New York State Senate is leading the way against this context of an institution with an incredibly bad reputation, um, you know, makes the Senate look good, frankly, and that is uh, part of the way that we have the internal empowerment to actually do these things, which otherwise might be kind of scary to some to some senators to be so open to be on TV 24/7 to have to listen to 300,000 people instead of maybe uh, 300 or 30 who they might have had to pay attention to historically. Um, so that's an important approach to change, I think, is and a reason to do all this kind of work publicly and not just within the walls of an ins of an enterprise privately, uh, is because it can actually help to effect that that change. Um, how to do it quickly? I mean, we, we just use the tools that we used in, outside of government in the sort of very uh, poorly funded nonprofit technology organizations or uh, in startup companies. We use the sort of free. Uh, software as a service, you know, web-based project management tools. This is one called Central Desktop. We, you know, Basecamp might be one that you're familiar with. Rather than building one or buying one, we said, you know, what? in two seconds flat, we can get that. We pay a few bucks a month, and we can start building our website. So that was one of the ways that we were able to build a website between you know the end of January and April um, was using quick, inexpensive, or or, or free uh, tools that we didn't need to su provide any technical support for, just to help organize ourselves and help organize do our work. And that was different than the way technology work and software development had ever been done inside the Senate. Um, I talked about our API, or you know, the, the person who built the voice system to uh, get legislative information uh, using the data that we publish. Um, again, we just think it's really important to do that and when you do it to adhere to open standards so that you're making government a platform, essentially. You're saying government is, is information and it's a body of, of labor. Um, but ultimately, it can be used for a lot of different things in a lot of different ways. And if you if you do that in a way that is following the standards that are being established um, by our peers to do those sorts of things, uh, it's 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 uh, you get a lot more leverage out of the work that you're doing. So if we just put up a website, it would be great to publish legislative information. If we put up a website and publish data that people can use to build their own websites, then you potentially end up with uh, slightly oversimplifying, but with hundreds of different websites that mash up that content with other relevant content. So say uh, the medical marijuana bill on a site that talks about the medical it, uh, and health related issues of marijuana or the news stories about it from medical marijuana debates all across the country. That might be an interesting web mashup to do. And because we use, uh, we provide an API, we adhere to open standards for our data publishing, it's, it's uh, easy for programmers to do that. Um, open source, we already talked about, you know, the website and the CRM and a lot of other applications we're working on are uh, not, not without exception, but, but uh, very often open source, meaning that 
we can publish all of our code without any legal uh, repercussions for, for doing so. And the benefit of that is that we think other people can benefit from what we're doing. And if we do that, uh, in turn, we fully expect that other people will do things that we can then benefit from in turn in the same, in the same vein. Um, and so we're leveraging off of each other's work, working with our peers in a collaborative way, and open source is a, is a very empowering uh, piece of that. And then at the very beginning, uh, somebody asked, you asked about uh, uh, whether we asked people what we should do. And um, we did, and we did that uh, in uh, June. So we launched the website in May, and in June, the beginning of June, we held Capital Camp. Um, it was a, an unconference. I don't know if anyone's uh, heard of unconferences or a bar, bar camps, or it was one of the more uh, more uh, uh, widely known versions of an unconference. And the idea is there that it's not a structured, formal event where you know a, a, a program committee says we're going to bring in speakers to talk about these things, and you're going to sit there and listen. It's a participatory event. So same in the spirit of participatory government, this was a participatory conference where they, we made up the agenda when we got there. We put up a a bulletin board at the beginning of the event, people who come in the morning say, okay, I want to talk about this, or I want to hear about that. We make up the schedule there, and then that way, um, we had an event that was really co-organized by citizens across the state. And um, you know, we had uh, more than 100 people show up, and we had a really great set of uh, sessions and discussions about everything that we'd done. And we got some really, uh, I think, um, uh, insightful you know, critiques. There were a lot of problems with the website when we first launched it, some of which we hadn't even been aware of uh, that was really important for us to hear and to create a feedback loop with, with our customers, if you will, citizens, um, about. And we also got some great ideas that we've then gone on to actually implement and to set our agenda for the next six months. A lot of those efforts came out of the discussions that happened at Capital Camp. And then in turn we do uh, you know, outreach, if you will, or participation in other communities. So me talking to you here today, um, I was out at a conference last week called OpenGov uh, West in Seattle, um, where people in Seattle and Pacific Northwest talking about open, thinking about open government, doing open government, were coming together. They had both a formal conference day and an unconference day to talk about how they could collaborate within their geography um, on open government. Uh, being part of a community that's figuring this out as we go is really important because, again, we don't have all the good ideas. We certainly don't want to do all the work ourselves. Um, community processes are very empowering, both for the precedent they set, for the learning you get, and increasingly, I think, for the actual hands-on uh, collaboration and leveraging off of each other's work that you can do, even to the point of literally sharing software code. Um, so where does this all lead in macro? And I'd say this is a, the, I, I'm by no means the most uh, thoughtful person on the planet about this, but um, to me, I'm excited about, uh, if you take this and what we've done in the Senate, and you did it across every legislative body in the country, and you did it in every city council, and maybe you did it in, you know, even in a lot of countries of the world, um, what would you get? Uh, and uh, if you really you know, looked five, five years out, well, today we've got you know, a lot of e-government services, you know, three-on-one, three-on-one in New York and many places in the country now. You, you call a phone number, you type in a website, I've got a problem, you know, uh, my neighbor's making noise, you know, and now it's easy for the city to provide a service to route you to the appropriate city agency to complain to. And then they do a pretty good job of tracking that and following up with you and getting back to you. Um, so that's a, you know, it's citizen service put in the hands of citizens much more readily than it used to, used to be. Um, we've got these, you know, commenting on legislation, uh, even online town halls like Obama's Open for Questions, we do versions of that. But it's, also, it's so hard for me to say, okay, I care about this issue and it's relevant to my city, it's relevant to my state, it's relevant to my county, it's relevant to my country. Um, it'd be hard for me to weigh in on that across all those levels of geography today. Um, I'm hopeful that in the next couple of years we'll make it much easier. So if I know something about something that's relevant across all those levels of political geography, making it much easier for me to, with one voice at one time, articulate that in a way that's actually heard and actually uh, heard across different government bodies. Um, that's something that I'd be excited about. Part and parcel of that would be my ability to control my information, not just as we discussed in terms of profiles and identity for the Senate, but I wouldn't want to have to do, go do that again for the New York uh, State Assembly, or for the New York City Council, or even frankly for the US Senate. I would want one account where I could say, this is Andrew, and I actually do live here. Here's what I think. Um, I want to only log in once. <laughs> and if I'm, you know, if I'm weighing in on a, uh, on a piece of legislation that affects an issue Again, across multiple levels of political geography, I'd like to be able to do that once. So, you know, portability of profiles, control of information, all the privacy issues and authentication issues that are 
part and parcel of that, I'm hopeful, will be worked out with, with federal leadership uh, in the coming years. But that takes people at the local, county, state, and federal level all working together and using open standards for identity management um, and authentication to, to make that possible. Um, so that, you know, in, you know, what would that enable? You could imagine someday, you know, not just public comment on regulatory rules or you know, uh, public comment on a bill, but actual, you know, sort of direct voting, if you will, on regulatory issues, on legislative issues. Um, you know, we vote on elected officials right now. That's not, uh, it becomes more and more feasible to start to have more direct participation or direct democracy, I think, in more and more things if you really achieve that, that infrastructure. Um, along a, a, a slightly different line, um, we're starting to see some really exciting examples of what I'd like to call citizen bureaucracy, or a lot of people are calling it we.gov. Um, and that is, you know, if you take the 311 example where I can, you know, call up the city and say I've got a problem, uh, the, the, the we.gov version of that is um, maybe best exemplified by a, a website called C-Click Fix where I can submit the same problem, hey, there's a pothole in my street, but instead of the city hearing that and then it goes into this, the black hole of the city and maybe they fix it, maybe they don't, and maybe you hear back from them. Um, in the case of a traditional 311, everybody sees it, right? And my neighbors see it. And uh, maybe not a pothole, but maybe a downed tree. If I see there's a, a tree down across the road in my neighborhood, maybe my neighbors and I can organize to go out and clean up that tree, and then the city doesn't have to. And that's efficient in the sense of it might get done faster, it might save us tax dollars, um, and we have the opportunity to actually contribute in some very small way to our government. So that's a, sort of a peer-to-peer -peer 3 one, one. Um, And we're starting to see some great examples of that. If you go to see Click Fix and type in Cambridge Mass, you'll see um, some examples of that. Um, you know, the next level of that might be to think of uh, bureaucrats not being so much the, uh, and civil servants not being so much the direct providers of service to citizens, but more the, the coordinators, the, the organizers, if you will. Um, we've seen this a lot in political campaigns, right? You know, Obama came out of an online organizing background. His campaign was very effective in many, in, for a lot of reasons, but in particular because he leveraged a lot of goodwill and a lot of volunteer labor. And his staff were not the ones necessarily knocking on the doors as much as they were the ones organizing the people knocking on the doors. So there's, I think, a corollary to that in government for government being the curators, the conveners, the organizers, but having citizens more and more be actually providing the expertise, doing the labor, doing the work of government. Um, not in every realm, but certainly in some, in a way that I think can potentially deliver a lot of efficiencies, and you might call a citizen bureaucracy. So back to efficiency, and this is where I think we end up at the end of the day as the rubber meets the road on all this, is you know, why, why care? It sounds good. It's good, to, it's good to have transparency so your government is less likely to be corrupt, but uh, why does it really matter? Or it's good for me to have a voice, but why does it really really matter? Um, it may make me feel good, but I think it ultimately comes back to you know, efficiency, not defined as economic efficiency, you know, the best government at the lowest cost, but also efficacy in terms of you know, a government that we really feel represents us well. And I think all, you know, that me.gov and we.gov really uh, uh, ultimately enables government itself to be better. Um, and part of that is uh, the direct participation of citizens. Part of it is also when you do this work and you make information available and it's easy to find and it uses open standards um, and it's easy to share. It's not just easy for me as a citizen to share that with my friend. It's easy for one government to share that with another government when you do that work, right? And so we're seeing a lot of examples now of cities helping cities States helping states, you know, Department of Labor's department, helping Department of Labor's, um, and all the permutations of, of that. And the promise of that is, you know, less redundancy. Uh, it's the ability to tackle really big issues in really efficient ways when they cut across different jurisdictions, um, and different political geographies, and different thematic areas. Um, and that I think ultimately has the possibility of providing better government at lower cost. And that's really important because uh, we are. Uh, in an economic uh, pickle, and uh, a lot of dissatis people dissatisfied with our government. So I think that's why, at the end of the day, I care about all this all this work. Um, so that's all I'm going to say, and I'd uh, love to open it up to discussion. I have no idea how long I've talked, so um, it sounds like I've talked through uh, most of our time as it is, but I'm glad to stay and talk for as long as anybody would like. No, we're uh, that's that's coming next. Uh, we had we had uh, one of our challenges. We had you know, uh, 1,300 employees who had email addresses and cards and stationery and all these things. Um, so that's coming. 
And I think actually we may have already done this. Uh, you may be able to also do you know, hop in at nwestsenate.gov, but sort of that that brand existed previously in a way that was widespread, whereas the website brand didn't. So it made sense to, to change the website first. Yeah. So how how big is your office? Like, how do you organize your team to get all this to happen? What kind of capacity do they have? Yeah, so we had about 35 people who worked in the Senate before in what is called Senate Technology Services, and that was primarily all this internal enterprise IT, so the, the copiers, the printers, the PCs on the desks, and some software development, uh, like the database that runs our payroll, and you know, cut, cuts the checks, the Senate does all its own business systems as well, um, and also support, so they you know give people classes on using Microsoft Excel, it's actually a pretty high level of sort of service and support for technology. So we have uh, really almost all of those same, and telecom, telephones, internet connectivity, all that. We have most of those same people to provide that ongoing inter enterprise IT support, although we're modernizing a lot of it. The work that's been done in the sort of government 2.0 realm has been primarily done, although certainly with contributions by that, by those legacy people, by uh, eight people, including myself, that I, that I brought in. Um, so that's, that's our sort of CIO team, if you will, is, is eight people. And actually one, one of those, seven, seven new people one person who is the director of Senate Technology Services, who's been sort of very directly part of our team and helping us kind of bridge that legacy workforce and legacy institutional stuff with, with the new stuff that we're doing. So that's the scale. Um, you know, I don't know if that's big or small. I just know that I sort of, again, our bottom line is let's make sure we try a lot of new things and some of them will fail, some of them will succeed. Let's make sure that we uh, not only don't break the bank doing that, but we actually save money because uh, we have a terrible budget in New York State. And so that was imperative. Yeah. Um, but it is hard for us, but what level level you can disclose that? What level of investment you know, this system will demand to establish? Certain financial? Yeah. Yeah, so um, again, open source software, so no, no financial investment in terms of licensing. Um, we did engage a consulting firm both for the website and for the CRM system. In the case of the website, because we wanted to start right away and we had no, no staff with the skills to do it. In the case of the CRM, because we already were kind of all busy every day and we were building a big new piece of software and we weren't necessarily experts in CRM software so we had to sort of bring in outside help to do that. Um, in both cases though we've taken it over internally so we now support and extend those systems all with our own staff. So the budget for each of those consulting firms was in the neighborhood of, of 100k. So it wasn't nothing but it was uh, also not the scale of, of for example the first quote we got for the getting a proprietary CRM system, the one that's used by the, uh, I think a majority of the people at the federal level to do this kind of stuff, was I think $7 million was the first quote. Um, I think that came down to $3 million by the time our negotiation was done, but, and then there are ongoing annual costs therein as well, and you can't take it in-house and support yourself. So the numbers on, on both of those were pretty easy for us to justify. Um, but we did because we didn't already have the, the staff with available time to do it have to engage outside consultants to do the initial development and so on. Yeah. Um, in addition to the capacity to roll it out, you also obviously had political will that made all this possible. And it, there are a number of things you alluded to where that was clearly necessary, like the statement of the, pub, the publicly stated aggressive goals, the copyright policy. And how many times did you get to a place where you needed leadership in the Senate to um, create, you know, the mandate for doing this versus just they were smart to hire a great person like you and your team and you could just charge ahead and do it. Yeah, you're his sister. Yeah. <laughs> um, they can tell too. How many, how many times a day is probably the, most, the best question. I mean, a, a lot. I mean, we get, we get pushed back a lot. There are 62 CEOs, we like to say, in the Senate. There are 62 senators and they're all peers and they all don't always agree. Uh, you know, there's two major political parties, but even within the parties, there are all different opinions about what's important, and we have to balance and prioritize our work of, in service, ultimately, to, to 62 people who don't agree with each other very often. So um, that's an ongoing challenge, and we've had to, uh, we, we only got to do this in the first place because the leadership that uh, was in power in January of 2009 uh, had, you know, said it was important. They said it was important because they said during the campaign that it was important, um, and then some of the administrative leadership, the secretary of the Senate, as the chief administrative officer of the Senate, has really uh, tried to um, a empower us and b sort of insulate us from from uh, you know, people that or, or uh, concerns that might have really been been roadblocks. And then we've been sort of serendipitously and ironically helped by some of the tumult because the rules report that I or the the rules recommendations that I put up on the screen that were 
published in April were only adopted in June after this political coup, so-called, happened, where part of the resolution of the coup was uh, to get these two senators that had uh, decided to change parties to change back to the other party. Um, they had said that their desire to change the other party was in part because they wanted more reforms faster. Um, whether you believe that that was the reason or not, uh, part of the deal for them coming back was to actually pass those rules reforms, and that provided the the legal mandate, these are the rules of the Senate, to actually follow through and complete some of the work that we've began, begun. So um, I can't take credit for that, nor would I have ever wanted to incur that, that political tumult, but that actually did end up ironically helping us um, to actually move move faster with more of a mandate. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious to know, since you're one half of one of three branches, uh, what the other uh, branches are uh, doing in New York. I mean, obviously a lot of states are interested in you know, possibly copying what you're doing, but how about the executive branch in New York and all its agencies? Are they sitting there going, oh my god, are we going to have to do this too, or are they enthusiastically embracing what you're doing? Yeah, pretty much all over the map. And the, the state CIO's office has been pretty enthusiastic, but they also very freely vent through they don't have this skill set, they don't have these people from outside of government that are used to doing developing software in this way, and they don't they have hands-on experience doing enterprise IT, and they provide a lot of government services that are a lot more complex than we do. They provide email to 40 different state agencies, for example, um, so and uh, host a lot more servers than we do. So um, they're, uh, we, we've formed, I think, a pretty good sort of open communal relationship with our peers in, in other parts of government, in particular the state CIO, but also our, our colleagues in the assembly. Um, and also agency CIOs, are about 100 agencies in the state that each have their own CIO or some version of that. Um, and uh, we have a CIO council which has been set up where the CIOs of each agency are party to it. And the CIOs of some of the counties are party to it as well. And um, I was elected to the leadership of that council and so we're sort of trying to figure out what are the areas in which we really need to collaborate and can benefit most from collaborating across and um, across different branches of government, absolutely, but also between even agencies in the executive branch. Historically, we've had agencies in the executive branch buying totally different software <coughs> systems with, that require different skill sets to maintain, making it really impossible to share the load of maintaining those systems, um, or even to share you know, staff with particular skills. And that's just an inefficient and unnecessary thing, just born out of lack of coordination. Um, so we're pretty actively trying to have you know the areas where we think we've broken some good new ground, we're trying to evangelize and share that in part so that our peers can, can uh, benefit from that. Yeah, so you had um, Yeah, with regard to the sort of data sets that you put online, if, if you've got much information on who's actually using it and what, what they're using it for, so is it sort of individuals or is it journalists who are out looking for a story or, or, or is it sort of other yeah. developers sort of making other yeah, I, I things think out not, of it? Not nearly as much as I'd like. We don't have, we, we you know, use these tools to, to gather analytics and we publish those stats. Mm. Um, there's a lot of information there. We don't haven't really taken the time to sit down and analyze that and then to look to optimize that. Like, who are we reaching and who are we not reaching? Um, mm. And I'd love to be able to do that. It's been a sort of overwhelmed by, needing, by trying to do too much too fast uh, as the sort of excuse for why we haven't done that. Um, so what we have, I'd say, today are, you know, we have the raw data, but without context, it doesn't really matter that much. I mean, okay, 15,000 people watched that event live. Well, so what? Um, it's great, but you know, yeah. the context is really important. Um, and then I think that uh, we have some great sort of vignettes or you know, case studies or stories that have come out of it. And the senator from Staten Island, whose you know, speech was watched hundreds of thousands of times about marriage equality, she has a very direct personal experience with how empowering these tools can be for her. Um, but you know, those are the those stories are sort of the exception rather than the rule. I think the uh, attitude is a little bit that um, we've got to. We got to build it, and then it'll be used for things that we hope will be useful and meaningful. And I think that the proof of that, and how useful and how meaningful, and which pieces are irrelevant, which pieces are really surprisingly useful, is still very much in process. And you know, we're we're a year into this, and I think that that's one of our major goals for this next year is to really drive adoption and understanding of these tools, so that senators are, as a matter of course, when they develop policy, they're always you know considering the opinions. Uh, that have been submitted through a legislative website via public comment, as well as the people that show up and publicly speak at the physical offline event, as well as the lobbyist who uh, comes and, and gives them their memo about what they want them to do. Um, and you know, jury's absolutely still out on how successful we'll, we'll be on that. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, so can you talk a bit more about the features of the CRM, the new CRM tool that you have out here, and also what is sort of some of the best practice CRM tools look like? Um, sure. So uh, CRM is like you know multi-billion dollar industry and, and uh, one where a lot of innovation has happened over the last couple of years. Uh, historically, it was you know tools to help people sell things. You know, Salesforce.com, right? It was um, built to help people sell things, and increasingly, there it's there are information management systems for information about people um, and for communications, maybe sort of strategic, well-coordinated, scalable communications with people. Um, and so, in government, traditionally, that has meant you know a voter file goes into a people database, and then you add a lot of data to that voters record based on what they do or don't do. You know, they called up, they came to a meeting, they volunteered, they gave money in some cases if you're in a campaign rather than government, etc. Um, so we're definitely we're we're trying to meet the bar of being able to do that well because that wasn't being done well in the Senate historically it was that command line interface uh, historically. So that's our starting point is we gotta meet that bar and we want to do it with a inexpensive, flexible open source platform to, to meet that bar well. Um, but then, from there, what we want to do is make it really easy, as I said, to uh, have information flow organically in and out of that system so that it's not, it's not something that people have to do manual data entry into to gather information. You automatically get information about an issue or about a citizen that, when they're expressing that opinion or something about themselves publicly into the CRM system. And also so that your communications out can be not just one-to-one, -one, but you know, one-to-many in a very targeted way so that if... Uh, all the people that have said something about uh, marriage equality in the last month, you know, I want to send an email to them today. Um, all the people that have opted in to receive email from me and have said something about marriage equality in the last month, I want to send them an email today because I just issued a, uh, you know, a press release or I just changed my vote or whatever it is that I want to communicate. And making that really easy because all these senators and their staff are overworked and in some cases underpaid, in some cases maybe not. Um, and uh, they are, it's, it's challenging to get people to do new work and you know, to take on new workflows, if you will. And CRM is about new systems to get your work done in a more efficient, more scalable way. So in order to get people to adopt new, new approaches that can be empowering, it needs to be easy and intuitive enough to, to do that. So the ability to send targeted email, for example, is a very simple thing that will derive from the ability to manage information about constituents better. Um, in a way that we think will help uh, make the use of email as a communications tool much more efficient and powerful for, for senators. So that's just one example. And there are a lot of different things I could say about CRM, I guess. Another thing is taxonomies, um, trying to make sure that what people call, you know, some people call it marriage equality, some people call it same-sex marriage, some people call it gay marriage, right? It's all the same bill, right? So how, if you're a senator, maybe you, you, you as a senator call it one of those three different things, or maybe you call it something else. Um, how can we make sure that it's easy for a constituent who says something about it over here and a senator who calls it gay marriage and another constituent who says something over here and calls it uh, marriage equality um, so that those two senators, maybe they're on the same side of the issue or maybe they're negotiating about it, so those two senators can speak the same language, if you will, or so that their CRMs can speak the same language. So we have a lot of uh, challenges around taxonomy and blending taxonomy, which is a structured, sort of ordered hierarchy of terms to define things. and tagging, which is uh, free, free form. It's like I could call it you know, 27 different things in 27 different systems. And again, making that efficient, making it easy to search in a variety of ways because of those nuances um, for the information you're looking for if you're a staff member. That's another thing that we're really taking on as a challenge. Um, and we want to, again, publish that kind of, what we figure out about that, we want to publish and so that our peers, say the state assembly, can also consider adopting the same taxonomy through the same approach so that, again, we could speak the same language and thereby collaborate on bills, which we inherently have to do. The Senate and the Assembly have to pass the same bill in order for it to go to the governor to become law. Um, so there's just a few examples of, of things that we're, we're doing that we're...